I said, you know, by the way, I have a book, and James said, well, let's try to do something. So I appreciate you all coming. Uh, I'm going to do is just kind of give you an outline of what this new book is about, and um, it has three sort of main sections, and I'll just talk a little bit about each. I'm not going to do a big lecture, and I'm not going to talk too long, because I'd like to have a discussion. Uh, if there are things that I present that uh, overlap with your situation, and I suspect there will be some, we can have, you know, sort of a debate about the, the sort of like similarities and differences, um, and you know, we'll see where that, where that kind of goes. So I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you. As James said, this is a kind of follow-up to my last book, which is called Dark Matter. Um, but some of these essays actually precede that book, go back about two decades. So there are three key uh, areas that the book covers. One is about the art world, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, I sort of present a term called, and I steal this from Agamben, I present the term bare art world, that we are now living or working in a bare art world. The second is Cities Without Souls, which is about gentrification, which I've seen firsthand in New York City now for 40 some years since I moved there from Philadelphia and also been chased through different parts of the city as I try to afford it to the point now where I'm pretty much on the edge and I don't even know if, we, if I can stay there much longer. And then resistance, which is missing an eight or so. So, I wanted to just start with this idea of the demystified art world to this idea of their art because when I went to uh, New York City, I studied with Hans Hacke, and Hans Hacke was well known as a, an artist who sort of tried to peel away the veneer of the art world to show you what was going on behind it, right? He did a lot of research. Later, this was called institutional critique. It wasn't even called that at the time, but that was a term that came in later. So he tried to demystify the world, and, and I was very much part of that thinking as a young artist. I think we've moved into a different phase now. That's what I'll try to talk about. Gulf, the spin-off group, decided to take more direct action. And so on a number of occasions, they actually invaded the Guggenheim and created a disruption. In 2015, on May Day, and I was involved in this action uh, as well, we went in, someone was basically in a wheelchair, she didn't need the wheelchair, underneath her was this parachute banner, at 10 o'clock in the morning she leapt off, leapt off it, and out came the banner. Very quickly the guards kind of came and tore it up, meanwhile we had people positioned upstairs in the atrium, this is of course the Frank Lloyd Wright building on Fifth Avenue in New York, dropping leaflets, and this is what it looked like down below. And the leaflet said May Day in different languages. There were also things like this, talking about the relationship of petrodollars to the art world, to the good and so on and so forth. On that particular day, um, previous interventions, they had come, done something, and left. On that particular day, the decision was made to occupy the museum, and everyone sat down. At a certain point, the museum called the police. They gradually let people leave the museum, but they wouldn't let anyone new come in. So the museum emptied out, and we sat there for maybe an hour or more. The police came. One of the police said to us, you know, we're just waiting for the car to come to take you away. And we took a risk because we thought, is the museum really going to have a bunch of artists dragged out of here, you know, in handcuffs? And of course, the police just vanished at a certain point. And we had the entire museum to ourselves. It was very strange and surreal. We could walk around and see all the exhibitions. It was just the guards and a couple of people doing on Karawa sort of performance in the window. <laughs> very surreal. Uh, the strange thing was a number of us had tickets to go to the Venice to Venice the next day. And so we were really hoping we weren't sent to prison overnight. I just want to read one, two more things. This is one of them, because I think Gulf really had sort of an interesting perspective. And as our name aggressively reflects back to the actually existing art world, I can call it the bare art world, its true nature, a spectacular subsystem of global capitalism revolving around the display, consumption, and financialization of cultural objects, uh, flippable art, etc., for the benefit of a tiny fraction of humanity, namely the one person. They have a very interesting manifesto, which uh, I can share with you as well. The next day, we went to Venice because there was the opening of the Venice Biennale, and Gulf Labor, the sort of more 
official group that sits down with the museum was invited by Oakley and Wizard to be part of the exhibition. Um, we actually took a lot of money, as much money as we could get from them, and we went to Abu Dhabi, and we went to India, and we interviewed workers, and that was what we used most of the money for. But for the opening, Gulf, the activist faction, decided to stage a little activity, and we organized with an organization, an autonomous space, somewhat similar to this one called Sally Docks, which means salt docks, which is in the city of Venice, and it has been occupied for six or seven years now. And they got some boats together, we made banners, we took off from the, uh, from the landing from Sally Docks, which is just around the corner from the Peggy Guggenheim collection, and we landed on the docks, and we took it over. And we set up our banners, and of course this is the dock on the Grand Canal, for the uh, museum. It's 2050. At one point we thought we're in deep shit. It turns out it was an art project. <laughs> of course. Um, we succeeded this time in accomplishing something. Finally the museum director here said, okay, what do you want? We want to meet with the board of directors. Because up to now we've been meeting with the with the uh, Richard, who was just the, you know the sort of uh, CEO you might say of the museum, Richard Armstrong. We want to meet with the board of directors because they really have the power to make decisions, and they agreed. And so we went back to New York. We met with them. Period of months, we brought NGOs in to talk about fair contracts that could be used in the Middle East, all kinds of things. And then one day they just called us and said, "We're not going to have anything more to do with you." That's it. And so we went and we did another intervention to say that they sort of broke trust with us and so far we've had no more negotiations. On the other hand, the museum itself has been put on hold. The financial capital almost seems to have no reliance on labor. I think that would, I mean, I would just change that a little bit. In that it's ideal is the, the, the long-term capital's dream of making money without having labor. You make it by magic, you know? You invest in something and boom, you get more capital and there's no need to go through the commodity cycle, which would require, you know, actual wage labor on some level, right? Um, so I think it, financialization is really bizarre in that it actually seems to think, at least, that it can create money out of, out of sort of money, right? Skipping over the whole process, right? M equals M, not M equals C equals M. Crazy. Okay. Um, but what might be, and I think if I can come come off with what you're saying is this kind of zone of affect, you know, and everything else that's subsumed, if I can use that word, right, by, cap by capitalism, just as the art world, I would argue, has been subsumed, and I don't know if there's any hardcore Marxists here, we can argue about whether that's the formal subsumption or the actual subsumption, these are, you know, huge debates amongst about 10 people in the world, but one way or the other there's a kind of subsumption that's happened that even the realm of art, which we always think of as the realm of liberty and freedom, is now part of the cycle of capital, right? Because these are private institutions, and they could just say, well, I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. Just like in the US, we have um, this ability for, organiz for people to get together and pump money into people's campaigns, but not disclose who they are. And this was a Supreme Court decision that was really a nightmare for all of us, and it continues to be. So it's similar, I think, in that way. No, because I, that's exactly what she's doing, Andrea. She's looking into what political donations all these big benefactors, if we want to call them, of museums have done. So I think it is very much linked with the current administration in the States, and whether um, there is kind of like a, a film of uh, conservatives that are that is covering the museums. Most people who go to museums in the art world tend to be either liberals or even maybe to the left of liberals. Very few are conservatives. So museums absolutely, in order to sort of be legitimate, are going to have to pay some attention to their constituency. And with groups like Gulf Labor and Gulf Occupy Museums, working artists the great economy and so on and so forth, putting pressure on those institutions, they're gonna to have to respond by doing something that shows they still are in politically in their camp 
I think in the book somewhere I talk about this as a kind of prog conservatism, progressive conservatism, because they can speak about these things, or LGBT rights, or things like that, very important things, but when it comes to actually changing the structure of the institution, say, making the boards of directors more diverse, or getting rid of people like Larry Fink off the board, they're not going to do that. So, yes, I think until we target that aspect of it, we don't succeed, we really just get gestures. It's, it's a bit of a conundrum, and a cul de sac if you want, in the sense that you do have a discourse, but how much active um, agency does art have to change? Um, this, is, this is the question that we all face, but I think we are currently at a moment that, uh, you know, the times are so hard that it, it's inevitable somehow for us to, 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 to pick um, a field, a position, if you will. Um, it is disheartening, I mean, we, you know, but I think the idea that artists are going to change the politics is probably naive. I don't think that's ever happened. I think artists have a tendency to follow more the political landscape than they do to really make it. And it may have shifted a little, but it, even in, I think, the revolutionary Russia in place, you know, in a way, artists were caught up in a moment that was much bigger than they were. And I think if we lose sight of that, you know, artists cannot change society through art. It just isn't going to happen. Um, I was in Argentina a year ago. Um, I was talking with an artist that is 70 years, 72 years old. Uh, he was one of the first E-flux artists, uh, E-flux, sorry, flux, flux artists. Yeah, that's an interesting story. Yeah, very much so, I have to say. Um, so he was one of the first flux artists, and of course because he was in Argentina and he didn't speak English, he was not as famous as the rest of them. Um, and he said to me, his name is Roberto Jacobi, he said to, I said to him, you know, it's, it's really horrible, the situation, I was being frustrated, just like you. And I said to him, you know, what can we do? And he said to me, I'm sorry to say it, he said to me, uh, sorry kiddo, you're fucked. Yeah. Well, there's, nothing, there's nothing to do. And he said, the only thing that you can do is uh, try to change things within your immediate cons constituency, like the people around you, your friends, your, your networks. You can't change in the large scale, and if you think that you can, then you're just hitting your, your head upon the wall. Language or grammar of finance and capital has infiltrated every level of our consciousness in, in many parts of the world, obviously, in our parts of the world, let's say. So that this is where, how we think. <coughs> and unfortunately, it's in the art world, this is why I describe it as a kind of bare art world, because the sort of relationships between capital and art have become so much more obvious. And I think that part of what we have to begin to do, and I, I try to come up with some something positive, because I think it is a very grim situation, is precisely the, the kind of things you're saying, is like to say to your friends, it's outrageous, I, this is what I should be doing, and you should be doing the same thing. And push back against that need to monetize everything. You know? Find ways of distributing, giving things away, whatever can, is possible to sort of you know, overcome that, that situation. I think it's complicated in the sense that financial capital almost seems to have no reliance on labor. I think that would, I mean, I would just change that a little bit. In that its ideal is the, the, the long-term capitalist dream of making money without having labor. You make it by magic, you know? You invest in something and boom, you get more capital. And there's no need to go through the commodity cycle which would require, you know, actual wage labor on some level, right? Um, so I think it, financialization is really bizarre in that it actually seems to think, at least, that it can create money out of, out of sort of money, right? Skipping over the whole process, right? M equals M, not M equals C equals M. Crazy. Okay. Um, but what might be, and I think if I can come, come off with what you're saying, is this kind of zone of affect, you know, and everything else that's subsumed, if I can use that word, right, by, cap, by capitalism, just as the art world, I would argue, has been subsumed. And I don't know if there's any hardcore Marxists here, we can argue about whether that's the formal subsumption or the actual subsumption. These are, you know, huge debates amongst about 10 people in the world. But one way or the other, there's a kind of subsumption that's happened that even the realm of art, which we always think of as the realm of liberty and freedom, is now part of the cycle of capital, right?
you can exist also self-organized act in a city. And as long as the artists they have a coalition and participation in the social movement, the art world, the, the underground art world is empowered, and also like the, the, the artists can empower the social movement, and the social movement defends the artists. Um, in a way, like um, we cannot expect anymore, you know, like the art to change the world. Okay, this was like a early 20th century idea that uh, seemed to fail. But we can continue believing that the artist, the art can change the people that will change the world. This means that um, like, uh, we cannot have like an isolated art space that can defend itself. As long as existing social movement in a city, the artist will empower the social movement and the social movement will defend the things. Because and also, we cannot have uh, underground art as long as you don't have confrontation with the police in a city. Because the power of the gentrification is very, high, very strong, the power of the, of, the, of the state is very strong, you know, the power of the money is very strong. So as long as you have social movement against state and against capitalism, then you can defend some spaces that they can have like social activities, art activities, cultural activities, and also political activities. So, for us, it's like um, the, the, the cultural activities, the social activities, and the political activities, they have to be together. As long as they don't exist together, the political activities, they don't have aesthetics, the, the art activities, they don't have meaning, and the social activities, they don't have power. I will give you like an example. Like after the Indignados movement, like a general social movement like in, in Greece and other countries, we have like this that we call somehow we try to make a rough translation like the um, direct markets, uh, markets without a uh, medium. Or like uh, producers, uh, agricultural producers, that they were going in the, uh, the towns uh, and in the cities, but uh, this happens to be in the towns, okay? That they were bringing the agricultural programs, di products directly from the uh, from the village and from the from the countryside. They were bringing the town. They were defending a square for an afternoon, like for some hours, and they were selling the products directly to the people without uh, without paying taxes. Occupy on Wall Street, at least anyway. I mean, I know yeah. these Ricardos and all the other movements are obviously very different, but. Um, there was an element, definitely, through the art world, vis-a-vis -vis different things. The occupation of artist space was a piece of it. A group called 16 Weaver Street, where, where many discussions going on at the time, was definitely kind of feeding into it. And uh, Nato Thompson's exhibition, Living as Form, it, we were there and there was a bunch of us in the exhibition when Occupy was starting to really take root, and everybody just said, well, let's go then. And so suddenly all these kind of artists kind of moved in. So I think there is a kind of interesting relationship. I would not go so far as to say that it was an art project, um, as some people have suggested, um, although I think it has certain relationships to the way art has transformed itself into an arena in which one can not only question and think and reflect on the world, but also talk about ways one can organize and be involved in the world. Right? I think this is an interesting thing that art has incorporated certain aspects of institutionality and administration into itself. So that, I mean, and this goes back to the Russian Revolution even, where artists were like not just thinking about making abstract art that somehow broke the rules, but like literally talking about organizing and creating counter institutions, the Victumus, the famous educational institution, right? So it's, a, it's woven into, I think, modern and contemporary art to also think about how you're how you're dealing with the world in relationship to it, organizationally, even institutionally. Um, I use a term in the last book in particular called the mock institution, or mock institution. I like making words up. Which is to say that artists creating their own institutions, but they're fake institutions. All these tools that the corporations can use, and we can also borrow, but we you know, do it in this kind of almost uh, tongue-in-cheek way. <coughs> But the irony is that often the art, the fake art institution works better than the one that they're pretending to be, right? In the end, it actually does a better job uh, in many cases. It also has its downsides. So Stephen Kurtz, who was a founding member of Critical Art Ensemble, uh, which was a group of 
three to five people, depending on how you look at it, in 2004 was accused of bioterrorism because of one of the projects they were doing. And it had nothing to do with terrorism, but it had to do with biology and genetics, etc. And I think my analysis would be in part, the government, this would have been under George Bush Jr., the government really sort of like looked at this critical art ensemble. It must be some network of, you know, collective, you know, uh, agents and terrorists. It's three, five people, you know, who basically didn't even have an NGO status. They just got together and did things. But they projected the possibility of an institutional reality that was much larger than it really was. And I think this is the moment that we are in in many cases, because if you look at the art world, it's full of institutions, right? the center for this, the school of that, you know, and 99.9% .9 of it are, they don't really exist, they're not legally, they're not NGOs, they're not, in the US we call 501c3s, they're just, they're just made up. After the crash, after the 2008, and after Occupy, etc., a lot more emphasis on social production and the visibility of social production. There's a lot less of that mythology that artists are these kind of lone individuals who stand outside of history, they stand outside of society, they have no other islands. No, I think we all recognize, you know, I'm babysitting your cat so you could make a painting. You know, let's face it, we're all working together to produce this thing called art. And I think that visibility has actually also allowed more of a sense of the social labor that goes into art to be visible. And I, I think that's where we are, and that's a, I think that could be a very positive thing. It could be. I find myself uh, more and more falling in a downward spiral as a creator and also as a facilitator by confronting on one side what socially engaging and political affairs more and more instrumentalized, and at the same time coming from emerging the dominant we see this year's uh, document, for example, being built around this type of art. Uh, we see that the secondary, we, I was growing up in a time when we had this primary and the secondary market, now we see that we have more markets, and we definitely see it's, there's a particular mark for this type of art as well. And uh, at the same time, the second part of my, uh, uh, of my concern is that we see the emergence of a new morality that is built around exactly this kind of practices. For example, we see that artists are engaging uh, in these practices, are using more and more in their language uh, things that are built on beliefs, not only political beliefs, but also personal beliefs. Therefore, uh, all those are being progressive, they're building barriers. And at, the same, and at the same time that we see that everyone uh, and everything is bigger on beliefs, at least across the ocean, uh, I'm really afraid that maybe uh, we are becoming socially engaging and political uh, artists, artists are becoming, so to speak, the avant-garde of a new reactionary stream, exactly the opposite of what it started being. And uh, I would like to hear your uh, reflection. So it's reactionary because it, it pivots on this undetermined kind of notion of morality and it's not really very clarified, maybe? Uh, because it's, first of all, it's uh, being built around beliefs, such so as goodness, for example, mm -hmm. which who is to define this manifesting things about good and bad that's keep on popping up more and more recently. And we used to abandon this as uh, old-fashioned, uh, post-Christian, whatever, doctrines that we really didn't live in, uh, want anything to do with them. But we see them come again and again more uh, vividly through uh, maybe escapism in art or through Ecofascism—it's not really fascism, but it's still that radical uh, uh, ecology that has traits of fascism. And I can go uh, more and more on that. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, your observations, I think, are, are pretty spot on, I think. I mean, in the U.S., it's a little, you know, I can only look at the situation that I'm really familiar with, which is in the U.S. I would say at this point, you cannot make formal formalist art anymore, you know. Um, if you make a, let's say, a monochromatic painting and put it in a gallery, you better have an explanation for how it relates to society beside it. Right? It's the color of the sky over Tahir Square, you know. It's not just blue. It has, and it's 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 permeated every aspect of academia. And I'm completely blamed to be blamed for this as well. Hans Hacke, my professor, me, all Martha Rosler, all the people I know, in a way, participated in saying, you know, you you can't just make art about formal concerns. That's that's bullshit. You know, we need you need to think about the sort of social reality of it and in art history. So there was a time when you could have, be an art historian and you could complete, you could look at the raft of the Medusa and talk about shapes and colors and forms and never mention the history that is going on in the painting. It's not possible anymore. But maybe it's now gone to the point where it's impossible to not talk about some aspect of society when you look at, let's say, the work that's in Documenta and you, you're digging around, what is, it, what is the social meaning of this? You know, if it doesn't have a social meaning, that it's worthless to us, right? So I completely agree in that sense that this is the condition we're in. Whether or not it's reactionary, I don't know, I'd have to think about that some more, you know, in terms of the question of politics. As a general critique, though, I agree with you. There's a kind of free-floating, like, morality. It has its uses. When we had our recent election, many, many people took to the streets. People went to the airport when the travel ban was in place. And it wasn't just activists, it wasn't people who had an analysis, it was like everybody, it seemed. Because they felt that they could do that, they should do that, they should be activists. It's, it's kind of interesting, it's kind of a generalization of dissent that we've seen happen since November, in the US anyway. If it just remains though at a kind of like morally indi you know, indignant level, I think it could easily be used in a very negative way as well. I mean, if it doesn't develop a, a more critical analysis in an organization, then I would have to say. The reason I think that, uh, well, I, I can only speak about Marx's idea of, of, of art, which he spoke very little about, but he does talk a little bit about it in the Grundrisse, which is the theoretical text that lays the foundation um, you know, for the work he did at Capital. And he talks about you know, the artist basically produces uh, from and he uses the pronoun his, of course, from his natural tendency to make things, like, and he compares the artist to a silkworm, and that the silkworm would produce silk under any circumstances, and it's only human beings come along and see some value in the silk and make something else out of it. Precisely the same idea being that you would come along and see what the artist made, and then it would enter into the commodity, the field of the commodity, right? So that the production of art or the labor of art is not commodified prior to its possibility of entering into the system of capitalist relations. Um, I'm not sure that still is correct today. I mean, it's a much longer discussion, so I, we can't get into all the nuances maybe. But I do think there is some essence there that's important to grasp that the idea that, especially the young Marx proposed, that one could be, say, a painter, you know, in the afternoon, go fishing, you know, in the morning, tend to the tend to criticism in the evening, this idea that your labor would not be commodified ahead of time in any way, right? It would be yours, your time would be your own, because it's really all about time in the end. I mean, if communism, as Guattari said, is about anything, it's about the liberation of time. And if your time can be liberated, then that seems to me to be the essence of what the possibility of art sometimes it does present, right? It presents it at least to the everyday person. The question is, does cultural work, being an artist, belong to working class? Is it the same as, or is it belong to proletariat? I would say no. That doesn't mean that the proletariat doesn't produce what I would call art, even if the system doesn't necessarily, the system, the art world system doesn't recognize it. I would say that people do produce culture and art all the time, even when it's not recognized. But I would not say that the artist 
meaning those of us who have studied art, went to art school, that we are proletarian by any means, no. I'd like to be, think that I'm somehow in solidarity, but I would never consider myself. And I, work, I come from a very pretty working class background. Do I think that the essence of art is uh, to just constantly produce? No, I don't think that's the case. I think all of us are much more complicated at this point. We're stuck in so many different subject positions and situations. I teach, I organize, I write, I make art. I'm an artist, that's how I was trained, and I still make art. I would never want to say that there's an essential component to that at this point. You know, I'm not sure there's even a, a subject behind it all, to be honest with you, even if I am called by a name.